Good morning, everybody. We're waiting for some more people to join. This is Akron Arabella, live from the Annapolis Boat Show. I'm Annie B. Headless. <laughs> I'm right here. It's Steve Brady. Good morning, everyone. The sun is just, just peeking up here in Annapolis. It's a beautiful day. Lots of beautiful white plastic boats. And uh, yeah, it's been, it's been crazy so far. So we left. We got up at three o'clock yesterday morning and drove to the airport and flew from Connecticut down to North Carolina because there was no direct flights to Baltimore. Had a layover, flew into Baltimore, came right to the show, got completely overloaded with people. Um, met up with some folks from Jamestown Distributors last night, had a couple beers and some burgers with them, which was really great. Got to catch up. And then uh, Anne and I crashed on one of her friend's catamarans last night. And now we're here for the boat show. So we're gonna uh, walk over and go talk with John Harris, who's the owner and CEO of Chesapeake Lightcraft. And we're gonna talk to him about tender design. So John's done a lot of boat design. Most of the stuff they work with is uh, plywood stitching glue, which is not how we're gonna build the tender. But John really understands tender design and initial stability and secondary stability and how to build a light boat and how many layers of glass to put on for what you want and all that kind of jazz. He's got that stuff dialed. And when Akin drew the plans that we're considering, uh, a lot of the modern technology didn't exist. So the boats are traditionally designed and built, um, which is great, but unfortunately for a tender, it means that they're kind of heavy uh, and they're not as robust as they could be. So with modern epoxy and glass and everything, we can make the tender, we can still build it to an Akin design, but we can build it lighter and we can build it tougher, uh, which for a tender that we're gonna run up onto rocky beaches and throw off the boat and tow behind the boat and everything else. We want something that's very light and very durable. Uh, it's easy to maintain, easy to clean, uh, something that we really can use and abuse and it will stand up to it. Uh, so we're looking to take one of the Akin plans and kind of tweak it a little bit and make it into hopefully a really robust tender. Uh, we're gonna talk to John about that and see what he has to say. I'm, I'm sure he's uh, full of opinions and information and uh, can't wait to hear what he has to say. So let's wander through the show a little bit and uh, go meet up with him. Sure thing. And I just wanted to say greetings. There's folks here from, from Australia, Antibes, Japan, nice. South Africa, That's awesome. <laughs> Georgia. Love it. Thanks so much. Hello from Germany. Love seeing where every Oklahoma, Long Island, New York, Holland and France and um, and good morning everybody I hope you I hope you're enjoying the view here um, so the show is here in Annapolis because Annapolis is is a really big sailing town and um, Steve and I got to take a uh, got to take a um, water taxi yesterday and yeah, see a bit fun. of what was on the water um, and uh, yes there are a lot of uh, fiberglass boats here and this is the home of the Naval Academy so these are things that aren't necessarily wooden boat related but you wouldn't believe how many things just are oh, anchors in. and roller furlers and lines and that doesn't care if you're a plastic boat or a wooden boat that's all the same it is it's yeah. true all your nav systems your sails your rigging and um, and in all honesty it's it's there's just so much crossover. And also UV wants to hit all these boats just like it wants to hit Yes, a that's true. Boat. The sun does not discriminate. <laughs> Double braided line on any boat is <laughs> has a shalom from Israel. Good morning, Robert. So we are making our way over here to John's area. There's a lot of boats on display. This is a spot called Ego Alley. Usually it doesn't have this many docks in it. And there's a lot of floating spaces that um, that are set up especially for the show, and uh, it's kind of amazing to see and walk across <laughs> some um, things that aren't land, and that there's a lot of people walking around and nearly falling off of all these docks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure someone will by the weekends. And yes, yes. And we heard. We actually heard. We we don't know a lot about what happened yesterday. If you've heard on the news. There's possibly something about um, a shooting that happened here on site. We don't know a lot about it, but we hope that everybody's safe and we hope to hear news soon. Yeah. Okay. 
and just talk normal. Cool. We could do the whole thing where we pretend like we didn't just see you five minutes ago. Oh, hey, John. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Good morning to you. Good morning. Oh, look, the sun's coming up. Oh, yeah. Nice. It's true. I, I don't know if anybody, oh, you can see the paint. Nice. Well, I just got out of bed. I don't know about you guys. Uh, yeah, up at like 5.30 okay. for a little Did bit. Did you get some time to, you know, uh, tend to the pigs and the livestock? And yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, John, uh, we're here for Small Boat Design. Can you tell us a little bit about the Chesapeake Lake Craft Start in 1994? 91, 1991-ish. Uh, uh, it assumed something like its current form around 1994. Um, Chesapeake Lightcraft is a boat kits and plans company. Uh, I was the first employee, and so uh, I've been there for 27 years. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I, <laughs> I just haven't figured out how to do anything else. Uh, and uh, what Chesapeake Lightcraft does is help people build boats, um, especially their first boat, but we have a lot of sophisticated designs, too, um, for people who want to graduate from relatively simple boats. Uh, yeah, and you even got the teardrop trailer. That yeah, that's pretty cool. It, it occurred to me somewhere along the line that a, a teardrop camper is really just an upside down dinghy, and uh, much, yeah. And and that way, it you know, we were able to use all of our our boat building prowess, uh, uh, techniques, and technology to uh, to build a camper, and it's been very successful, which is a good thing because uh, it's paid for a lot of money losing boat building projects. <laughs> Yeah, I actually have a friend who saw your camper at um, the Mystic Show and then went and designed and built his own. Right on. But inspired well, by it. Inspiration is everything. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I collect nautical books. And, and um, one of the things I've realized that I think maybe some other people in my industry haven't is that there's absolutely nothing new. And, you know, if you think you have some ingenious idea or some way of designing a dinghy or it's been done before you just don't you just don't know about it so <laughs> yeah, you think yeah, you're yeah. really smart um but yeah. uh i uh after talking with you guys last week um i enjoyed going through my collection of uh william and john atkin um small craft plans nice. um from the 1930s and 40s these are uh, uh, put out by a magazine called motor boating yeah, the the Atkin Beautiful. they drew a bunch of plans for them over the right. years. Right, there, yeah. there are there are as many sailboats and dinghies and things in here as there are motorboats, and um, I, I enjoy the irony that you know, in this century, the idea of a motorboating magazine of any kind publishing plans for a sailboat, <laughs> or even mentioning the existence of a sailboat is, is really unusual, but. Um, Th that, in fact, it just doesn't happen. And uh, they were more a little more inclusive in the boat world back then, huh? They sure were. And you know, I just I love looking at these. And, and uh, as I, you know, just like I said, as I as I flipped through these uh, over the last couple of weeks, I just kept seeing really really great designs. And uh, you know, I think they really had most of it right 40 years before I was born. <laughs> yeah, you know, and uh, there have been advances in, in technology. Um, we couldn't have kayaks like we have now that are that are this light and you know, uh, and have so much shape and so and so yeah. forth. Um, you know, a lot of the a lot of the advances have just been in materials technology and the ability to build a yeah epoxy to, to, changed you know, a lot of things. Yeah, huh? yeah, I think I think epoxy was like. Is like the asteroid that that hit the boat building world, and uh, at least the wooden boat building world. You know, we, fiberglass is another matter entirely. <laughs> but but uh, with epoxy, suddenly, um, you know, people building boats went overnight from you know joining one piece of wood to the other by whittling a cleat yep. that you would screw into. And you know, maybe you'd use glue, maybe you would use dolphinite. You know, and um, there aren't a whole lot of these boats left in the world because they rot. Um, yeah, I like building boats like this. Don't get me wrong; it's 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 fun to make wood shavings with a plane. You know, but um, 
but uh, in, in 1959, a guy named Ken Little Dyke in England invented stitch and glue. Stitched the parts of the boat together loosely as, as you feel like, and then uh, connect the parts structurally with epoxy. In his case, epoxy wasn't around so much, so it was a polyester resin putty, but um, it didn't take long for people to figure out um, that you could really make something strong, you know? Yeah. That, that, that you could make boats, uh, wooden, wooden boats, more accessible to folks. Uh, and so um, along came uh, another Englishman named Jack Holt, uh, who with a, a team of marketers um, designed the mirror dinghy. Uh, okay. And uh, it was one. really the first big stitch and glue boat. You know, we're talking 1960, 1961 here, um, uh, before all of your viewers were born. <laughs> I don't know. We've got a few old viewers. Really? Okay. <laughs> well, um, Shout out to the oldies. <laughs> Rock. Rock. So anyway, uh, they built 70,000 mirrors, at least that's, oh, wow. that's, that's uh, <laughs> to, to my certain knowledge. So, you know, they, they were onto something, right? Yeah. And, um, I think it took uh, it took two things to make stitch and glue achieve liftoff or wooden boat building. The first one was epoxy, which, starting in the 1970s, became pretty common. And um, a, a couple of a couple of lads named Mead and Jan Goujon uh, pretty much took over the world um, with <laughs> epoxy and especially just the techniques of saturating wood. And so uh, Chesapeake Lightcraft came along much later. Um, but in, in time to use this style of construction to um, create really nice looking bows. I mean, I, I yeah, think, they're I think, beautiful. I think for a long time, um, uh, you know, build it yourself designs looked like you were building them yourself. Themselves. You yeah, know, yeah. And, 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 and then for a long time, um, boats that were designed on computers looked like they were designed on computers. And, and uh, Chesapeake Lightcraft has kind of bracketed that whole. Uh, innovation. I would imagine the computers and the lofting technology and CNC and all that was a big game changer as well. Huh? Sure. I mean, that was so that was 1990s. And, and now you could you could cut kits with, you know, really elaborate shapes. And I, you know, I think um, this dinghy over here um, is one of mine. Uh, I, I, I designed this to fit in the davits of a motorboat that I owned <laughs> at the time. Um, so it, you know, would fit crossways across the stern. And this has got a lot of shape. I mean, you could step back, well, I mean, just a pace or two and not really be aware that this was a stitch and glue boat. Yeah. Just like the mirror dinghy. It's got the, uh, you know, kind of full sections up top uh, with fine entry. At the, yeah, you got some real the, curve the, down you here. You know, right? And, you know, well, Billy Atkin, you know, uh, the Atkins were known for these kind of full plan views. Uh, I was a big fan of that. And that was really hard to do in stitch and glue and really hard to do with uh, computers. Um, it, took, it took 20 years really to get to a place where we could draw shapes like this. Um, and this isn't any harder to build than the simplistic shapes, but, um, uh, but it's obviously got a lot of shape. And uh, it, it marks the first time um, at, at Chesapeake Lightcraft that I was deliberately trying to make something kind of heavy. Okay. And why would you make a dinghy heavy? Uh, well, the reason is that in this part of the universe, you know, uh, the way the physics works is, is if, you know, if we made this and, and it weighed 70 pounds, and that would be possible. Yeah. If, if you stepped into it, it would fly out from under you, you know, oh, and, makes sense. and you'd end up in the water. Um, I, don't ask me how I know that. Uh, uh, so, you know, it's, yeah, it's, got, you wanna, it's got more structure You want structure a little inertia there, huh? Yeah, right, right, yeah. exactly. And um, Object at rest wants to stay at rest, sure. and object in motion wants to stay in motion. It does, yeah. So, um, again, it, it's possible to build something like this in this century that just weighs nothing. Um, but... Once you get over the threshold of 65, 70 pounds, you're not lifting it by yourself anyway. And you might as well kind of go right on up to uh, a weight that makes the boat practical. You know, 
stingies need three things. You need, you, you need uh, stability, if you're getting into it from another boat. Yeah. Uh, you need capacity. If you're going to go cruising and live on the boat, then your dinghy becomes the family car yeah, and the yeah. pickup truck. Yep. And uh, the grocery getter. That's right. Um, and and you, need, you need capacity um, because you're gonna, you might come home with 20 10 pound box of ice or something like that. Yeah. Speaking from experience. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, stability, durability, you know, they, just, they, get, they get beat up. Oh, yeah. They, they, they get, you know, they get, they get beat up and, uh, um, and, and capacity. And that's the, um, that's the three things you look, uh, th that I look for anyway. You know, we have a boat over here um, that's, uh, this is one I, I also designed just for me, um, not expecting that anyone would have any interest. It is a six foot long pram. Yep. Um, I have a, uh, like a seven, seven and a half foot pram, and the beam is about that. Wow. I mean, if you had two of them, you could make a catamaran. You could make a catamaran. And I, uh, I did it out of stitching glue, but I didn't use plywood. I used really wide, thin pine boards. Right on. But same right principle. On. Sure. And then uh, I made it because there's some really narrow brooks by my house that I go jump shoot mallards on. Okay. And it's really hard to quietly take the canoe down mm -hmm. through all these S turns, mm -hmm. and the brook is about yay wide. Sure. Um, so I made that boat to fit me, and I actually it was so tender that I ended up putting just a little foam right at the waterline just to sure, take yeah. it out a little bit. Um, but it's perfect. It goes right down the brook nice and quietly. I can spin the thing on a dime, mm -hmm. um, and did the ducks do never see me coming. Where it was in it, so people can see it later. Yeah. If they look back a little bit. Maybe yeah. we'll put it in the description later. Yeah, it's in one of the videos uh, of me making it, and then I also made little wheels for it, so I would tow it behind my bicycle. Oh, that's and great. I like hook it up to the that's bike great. and go ride down to the brook and go yeah. fish or go duck hunting, and so you might be surprised. <laughs> well, I was, and pe people have turned out liking. So, you know, this this one will finish out um, around forty pounds or so, and, and you know, there was a moment in the aging process where suddenly I couldn't lift a a 70 pound dinghy over my head anymore. And uh, also I had a pretty small sailboat. Uh, this needed to fit on the foredeck. So uh, I drew this up and built it at the wooden boat show in the booth. Actually, you can kind of see it's in the booth here. In the oh, photo. nice. Uh, uh, some years ago. And uh, it, it is, the original is planted atop the coach roof of my current cruising boat. And uh, it's great. I, I can, I can pick it up and put it in the water, but um, you should read the description of this on our website because it, it comes with a lot of disclaimers. It's, you know, it's tender. Yep. It doesn't I have, uh, you know, flotation tanks. Uh, it doesn't have a sailing rig. Um, it, uh, uh, and, and, you know, m m most specifically, it cannot take a motor. Okay. And, you, you know, that's the thing that, you know, I find really kind of frustrating is that it's all about the motor now. And uh, people, you know, I think it's, there, there's, a, there's a quote in a Phil Bolger book, and I actually looked this morning in the darkness um, <laughs> for, for this quote, but he's talking about, about people and tenders and rowing and, and, <clears throat> and the, the modern aversion to actually rowing a boat. And he says, you know, people, they really appreciate a nice, nicely shaped dinghy. They appreciate the fact that even maybe that can be rowed, but, and they might, they may even occasionally row it. But all serious movements, such as taking the dog uh, ashore for a walk, must be done under power. Power, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 phrase, the phrase is all serious movements in the dinghy. Um, you know, it, it doesn't matter whether it's just, just over there, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna crank the engine to yep. do it. And, that seems to be the way a lot of cruisers function, um, which is, yeah, it's disappointing to me. I, I uh, rowing's good for you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it, it requires a little bit of, uh, of you know, of, of seamanship to come alongside in a rowing boat. Whereas if you, the, the, the ubiquitous deflatable 
requires no seamanship at all. You simply point it at the mothership. <laughs> it, it makes a sort of rubbery boing, you know, boing as it, as it hits the side. Yeah. And then um, because they are massively stable, you can stagger a board. Um, After your 17th yeah. talk cocktail. That's right. It, yeah. it, as, as <laughs> you know, you might be pontooned and um, good thing you had that stability. Whereas climbing a board from one of these, um, you know, you, you've got to think about it. Yeah, right? I got to think about getting in and out of mine sure. for, for yeah. sure. I've often thought about taking it to the local like pond or brook and just leaving it there and sitting in the bushes and waiting to see if someone jumps in it and tries to paddle away because yeah, I think they'd make it about six feet mm -hmm. and then <laughs> yeah, my first boat uh, built when I was uh, uh, in junior high school uh, was kind of like that. It was so dangerous that I, I later cut it up with a chainsaw mm. because I was worried that someone might kill themselves. So, and I, I was yeah. not going to sell it or give it away. So I still have the bow, though. It's sitting in my office. So, nice. Uh, yeah. From John, humble someone, beginnings. Someone is uh, reading the FAQ for this boat on the website, LOL. <laughs> yeah, it, it, good. Is it a good um, time? <laughs> it, it is, it is a fun, it's a funny read because it's basically intended to filter out people who aren't like Steve and I, who are, we're, we're like wooden boat snobs and we've read, we've read <laughs> Hiscock and we've read yep. Party yep. and you know, we've read all of these people and this is how we look at sailing and, and uh, uh, and I think that, you know, the, the description for this boat basically boils down to if you don't get this boat, don't, don't, don't build one, you know. But if you want to row ashore, I've had, you know, this thing has a big payload and I've rowed it across really rough, choppy harbors with my family aboard uh, without any issue. And, um, if you're sorry. looking to go fish or duck hunt small creeks, uh, yeah, I think go. this would That's be a good bet. Too. Yeah, I, you know, I didn't expect anybody at all to want to buy or build one of these. So, um, but, but they, you know, they, they, they actually do sell. There still are some snobs out there who, who get it. You know, Probably guess. also be a really fun thing for, like, some young kids where you've got a small pond out back that right. they're always swimming and messing around in. And yeah, so make sure they're wearing life jackets. Yeah, yeah I, I, that's why I, I said swimming. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of the boat that you go out and you flip and you drag it back up into the beach and you have some fun. Be, being in the small boat business has conditioned me to, to think about everything in terms of litigation. litigation. Yeah, you know, for sure. So, <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, so it's got to have flotation. It needs, you know, if swamped, it needs to float upright and stable and be self-rescuable and, you know, so that puts this boat right back in the 1930s in terms yeah. of like yeah, safety, safety and so forth. Manage, so again, manage like, your risk. If, if you get it, you get it, you know. Um, uh, but uh, for everybody else, we have these lovely tenders that, that have built-in flotation and they're really yeah. stable. And um, I towed one of these behind my uh, engineless folk boat for many, many years. Um, and uh, it was my, that was my auxiliary power. I could uh, lash this bow to the stern cleat of the folk boat yeah. and uh, set the tiller pilot and then I would climb down into the dinghy and, and row and I could get about a knot and a half oh, nice. which you know so I could keep that up maybe for an hour there's always a little bit of wind that comes along within an hour I mean it's it's pretty rare so I never got stuck but um, it was an inflatable, like trying to row like that. Right? Yeah, rowing inflatables is not fun. Yeah, I mean no, that's just, made for like, it. you've got to hate yourself, I think, to <laughs> want to do that. So um, I've done it. <laughs> yeah. Well, so you know what we're talking about, times. right? Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. yeah. It, but the the place, you know, the that just seems to be the default tender. Yeah, uh, it definitely seems to be. Well, it also seems to be the the default boat is white and made of fiberglass, white plastic sloops. Yep. Yep. Right. Well, should we look at some uh, older designs? We brought yeah, the absolutely. plans that we yeah, were considering. Yeah, you know, I'm, that's that's kind of my jam. You know, I just I just love looking at these old things and uh, uh, and, and thinking about well, how much better they'll be in plywood and epoxy. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm gonna give just everybody a, a spin real quick around the camper. All right. Uh, where do you, you think's a good place to lay open. these out? Oh, right the table here. here? That's a good one. All right, so 
canvas tinder. I love that. Yeah. The original fiberglass. That's right. Cotton duck. All right. So maybe we can start with Handy Andy, and then we can go to Nymph, and we can go to Faye, and we'll go in the yeah. reverse order of what I think are my top three picks at the current moment. All subject to change. Obviously, this got distorted when we made the photocopy. So see, that's that the rudder look. should not be that big. That should not be yeah, that hogged up like yeah. that. But that goes on. But uh, you yeah. can see here what yeah, it that's actually supposed to look Beautiful set of lines. Yeah, I just like I love looking at the Atkins, beautifully concentric, um, uh, you know, buttock lines. And, um, so I, you know, I guess my question is, uh, you know, what's storage like? Are you going to store the boat on deck? Is it going to be upright or upside down? Or yeah. Is it be, you know? So. What we've got going on is we bought a Akin Eric that was built in the 1920s out of uh, Atlantic Cedar and Honduran mahogany. Okay. And we yeah. took that apart and scrapped it. And so we have an insane amount of mahogany and really old cedar. And I'd like to build a tender out of that and then name the tender Victoria in honor of Victoria that we took apart to build it. Um, so we'll be building her out of the cedar and the mahogany and the tender will most likely get stored upside down on top of the house. Mm -hmm. That's the goal. Um, so we're trying to figure out the house and the tender and the rig kind of all at the same time so that if we need to bring the boom up just a couple inches to clear the tender or if we drop the house that extra inch or if we move that thwart a little bit or move the butterfly hatch a tiny bit so sure. that everything will nestle really nicely on top of each other. So we're looking at, at Handy Andy, Faye, and Nymph are the three Akin plans mm -hmm. that I've been looking at. Um, and since Arabella is an Akin and Victoria was an Akin, I feel like we should Absolutely. stick with the family. Yeah. And, and you know, just again, you know, there, there's options. There, there must be, there, there must be Something. You know, 25 <laughs> fantastic Akin tenders. Um, only <laughs> maybe five or six that I had ever seen before I, I uh, fumbled into that collection. This is just an awfully pretty boat. I mean, I just kind of enjoy looking at the lines. And, yeah, uh, so this is um, Handy Andy. It's, uh, it's eight foot mm -hmm. and it is the smallest tender we're looking at. So basically mm -hmm. if we can't get the two larger ones, which are 10 foot tenders to fit, mm -hmm. then Handy Andy would be, be the one to go to. And I'm Absolutely. I know Akin has very strongly worded on their website about not messing with their plans. Um, but I personally would feel okay with a bit of guidance, you know, stretching Handy Andy from eight mm -hmm. to nine feet or taking Faye from 10 to nine foot six or, you right, know, tweak, sure. tweaking them a little bit. Um, it's definitely out of my skill and purview, but. It's, it's an incredibly pretty boat. And, uh, and you know when you talk about fitting the tender to the to the mothership, that you're joining a long uh, tradition of, of of dinghy designers and modifiers. The, the the curve on the cut into this transom back here, it isn't for looks. It's because that's the deck camber of uh, my MORC 27 footer that I converted to cruising and uh, nice. um, and so you know you can you can make some changes you know I look at this one I think an eight foot boat with a pointy bow and, and remember I mentioned uh, you know stability was you know one of the yep. one of the top things with a with a dinghy and so you know there, there's uh, you're losing some water plane area um, the boat it's gonna may, maybe tow a little bit lighter because it's got a pointy bow and it sure is gonna look nice um, but um, but you're throwing away a lot of a lot of capacity if you have a fixed footprint. Okay. You know, like I have this much by this much space to put a dinghy in it. So, um, you, you know, you may have to um, swallow hard and and put a pram bow, you know, mm -hmm. on a, on a boat just to have more stability, more payload. Um, okay. So, you know, either that or if you could stretch it two feet. Then you're gonna you're gonna get a lot more stability back. Yeah, length has as much to do with stability as as beam. Um, and I'd really like a, a tender that rows and sails well. I think uh, that is the priority over a motor. And then we'll probably pick up at some point a small, as you guys put them, deflatable, uh, with a <laughs> little outboard. When you've gotta get somewhere quick, you gotta 
go against that tide, sure. that current, yeah, whatever. I mean, I, you know, my, my kind of dream cruising yacht scenario would, would involve two tenders, you know, maybe uh, in two, two modalities. One, that's the, oh, I'm going to go sailing for the afternoon and explore this beautiful harbor, and that would be a boat like Handy Andy. And then, exactly. and then you have, you know, the, uh, the trash barge, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which may be whatever, you know, it, it could be a, something smaller. Um, so maybe, maybe it nests inside this boat for long passages. That was kind of the thought with the, like the, that, you know, with right? the deflatable. Yeah, right. just find mm -hmm. one that has a, a roll bottom or foldable bottom or whatever mm -hmm. that, sure. that could store inside. Yeah. Having I want to, really quick, I just wanted to define tender for everybody. That means a boat that is used to get you ashore. So dinghy and tender are interchangeable, essentially. Right, right. And um, uh, there was one other question I just wanted to get to you real quick. Sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to make sure. Uh, someone mentioned uh, COVID doesn't exist in America, apparently. Uh, all of us are vaccinated, and we're outside here, and we feel very comfortable yeah. with our choices. And we've, we've uh, that's, I just wanted to say that we take this very seriously, all three of us. And, uh, yeah, I was going to say, you're grabbing for your uh, mask. Yeah, I've got yeah. my mask. Is, 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 <laughs> you know the mask. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Audio is so, really tough yeah. for and them, I, too. And the reason I'm addressing that question is because I, I do hope, I would love for everybody to adopt a good practice with that. And um, thank you. That's yeah. <laughs> I think that's one reason we're doing this at dawn because this place isn't crowded. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. and, uh, and you know, I was here yesterday and the mask came on when the people, it, it started to get crowded yeah. here. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. you could almost smell the waves of COVID virus just swooping across. <laughs> I'm only half kidding. So, anyway, yeah. yeah. And then, you know, uh, uh, one, one thing to think about in this style of construction, you're, you're obviously talking about uh, the tr traditional plank on frame. I don't know whether you're thinking of, lap shaker carvel but but um, you know it's been forever like forever uh keeping dinghies from from shrinking and drying out when they're not in the water so that they're instantly available when you put the dinghy in the water and you don't have yep. to wait for it to swell up is, is something to think about and uh so my thought you know, with that like, it's a canvas uh, tinder so you know yeah that was that was the 1930s way of of trying to keep the thing watertight, you know. Um. So the, the tentative plan is to, uh, to rip up the cedar and or the mahogany and strip build it. Absolutely. I so mean, the plans to get, a, yeah. I haven't used them, but I know they make the, the plastic nails for the nail guns. Mm -hmm. And I've got nail guns and I'm just a strip builder, glasser, sure. and yeah. then we don't have yeah, to worry about you that know, the, so much. The, the internet is a, uh, uh, you can really go down the rabbit hole on strip planking. People have come up with marvelously clever ways to keep stripping without having to let one cure overnight. So, so you don't even have to use plastic nails. You can use clamps and, um, you yeah, know, but with a skin of glass inside and out, then it can stay, I mean, it just, it will never leak, but equally important, um, if there's rainwater, sitting in it it's not going to rot out in yeah. a season or two so yeah and i would um, like to ditch as much internal framing um i really like to fish i like to hunt and mm -hmm. i really like to adventure and explore yeah. so mm -hmm. i can pretty much guarantee that at some point we will anchor more the boat and load up camping mm -hmm. and adventure gear into the tender and go head up river and fill it full of bloody fish and have to clean it out and yeah a strip so. a strip planked composite boat in this you know of this shape may, might need one frame in the middle i mean okay. you can see here's a this is an eight, a just under eight foot dinghy uh, now it, it is glued lap straight but um which adds a lot of stiffness but it's got one frame in the middle and you know these things get bashed around um you know don't 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 focus in too close. You'll see all the scratches on this one. <laughs> all of these boats have actually been used. So, so yeah. That's, so what that's else, what else you got? To so look that's at, the so. smallest, Handy yeah. Andy, mm -hmm. and then Nymph's a bit bigger. She's a ten footer, and she's flat bottomed mm -hmm. as opposed mm -hmm. to the round bottom. Right. So. Yeah, I love these. These are. Uh, I mean, these will just never get old. Uh, the, the looks of a boat like this. That's, yeah. And this one's, I mean, so. insanely simple. You know, talk about ease of construction. I mean, it's yeah. Well, it's not stitch and glue, but in terms of uh, building would, a rounder hull, yeah. If, if you if you you know, by 21st century standards, you know, um, riveting um, uh, uh, cedar planks and so forth is probably beyond the reach of a lot of people, actually. You know, but um, 
this checks a lot of boxes, and one of them is the stability thing, just having a flat bottom. It's not as pretty, maybe it doesn't tow as well, but when you've got to step down to the boat um, with uh, 40 pounds of wet, dirty laundry or whatever um, to row ashore, you may really appreciate having a flat bottomed boat. And, um, that's a, that would be one thing to think about. And you know, My other thought, um, you know, w which is probably heretical, would be to substitute plywood um, for the bottom and the sides. Uh, and this kind of thing doesn't need fiberglass uh, as much as a strip plank boat might, but um, at least saturating everything in epoxy because you don't want to wait for it to swell up and you don't want to uh, uh, you know, have it rot from the inside if rainwater sits in it. So, yeah. You know, that's, um, <clears throat> on the other hand, um, lap strake of all the traditional methods is least likely to get much tighter joinery. So, yeah, the shrinking and swelling doesn't affect it quite as badly. Not as much, right. Yeah. So you, you, you could, uh, you know, I, I think you could, you could build it traditionally and, and it would leak less anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a ringing endorsement, is no. it? But, uh, it would leak less. Yeah. That, uh, you can you can tell. Uh, you know that uh, I like to mix the old and the new, and uh, the best parts of uh, of uh, uh, of epoxy construction and, and the advantages with traditional design. And you know, a boat like this one over here is right out of 1920s. You know, it, it's a clinker day boat, as the English would call it. A, uh, Swallows and Amazons, but it's really kind of what I was thinking about. Okay. Um, so, that's, uh, but yeah, you know, I think this would be great. It, it, you know, just I, utility-wise, you know, it's hard to beat something like this. And I, uh, I was lucky to do the entire Main Island Trail in a traditional open boat um, with the Chewanke Foundation. Oh, yeah. And uh, we towed a tender that looked. Pretty much exactly like this. It wasn't an Atkin, though. It was. Uh, I came unprepared. I can't remember the name, but it. Um, it uh, I think it had planked sides, but a, a plywood bottom. And, okay. Uh, and it was, it, you know, it was just great, and it got used like a pickup truck. I mean, it was used and abused, man. You know. Yeah, that's the that's the future for the tender. Right. It's definitely it's going to get run up on rocky beaches and mm -hmm. drug up on shore and all yeah. manner of mistreatment. So. Durability is one of the one of the top three there, and you know. Yeah, for sure. Um, it, you know, this is also at, at at ten feet and so forth. This is in the realm of something that it, you're, I guess you're going to have a tackle on the on your boom, uh, uh, so that you can yeah crane the boat into the water forward. essentially. So yeah. that's something that you have to think about, and you know, it's also at this length and displacement probably not practical to travel with the boat upside down on the coach roof. Okay, uh, it'd be better yeah, right side yeah, up. You know, fl flipping, flipping something of this, if, if it's built to plan, it's gonna be heavy. Um, we said the heavy is pretty, is not the worst thing in the world for a dinghy. You know, once you can't pick it up anyway, uh, once it's over 70 pounds, you're gonna be using a tackle to get it in the water. So that's cool. Um, but flipping it over on deck, you know, maybe you do it for the North Atlantic crossing, crossing. Yeah. you know, you do it once, you know, but well, as soon as you're in, in port, um, you know, having whoever's with your crew, having to do this um, on the coach roof, you know, with the boom in the way and everything else um, might be a challenge. So, um, you know, you have to think about, are you gonna transport the boat upright or upside down, you know, um, um, this adorable handy Andy, you know, is one that's small enough that you could you can flip it on deck with with another person. Um, yeah. Not this one. Um, this is gonna 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 travel upright, whether it's on the water or uh, hopefully, uh, or <laughs> or on the boat. So, but that would be a consideration for sure. Yeah, that is a consideration. Um, putting it upright on top of the house would be tricky because the hatch would definitely mm -hmm. be in yeah, the way. Yeah. All of a sudden, you don't have a. Uh, yeah, and flipping it over, you can nestle that hatch inside. Or at least, it should be theoretically possible. I have one of these uh, six-foot prams on my Swedish-built uh, cruiser, and it has a, you know, a, well, not a skylight like you're thinking of, but it has a 
it has a vent, you know, one of these Lumar ports, you know, right, right in the middle of the saloon. And uh, uh, since I brought the dinghy board and it lives upside down on top of the coach, um, that hatch has been open now for six or seven months. So the boat doesn't get boat smell. It's always, oh, nice. always ventilated. To, so having a boat upside down over your, you know, a, a, a skylight or whatever, um, it's a great way to keep the boat ventilated. Yeah, you can uh, leave that open and it's like having a roof on it. Right, it's just, yeah, yeah. it's great. It, it tucks right over it. But uh, So what have we got here? Oh, sir, I just wanted to break for a second. Is the PAX 20 no longer available? Uh, I think you can get the plans from us. Okay. Plans, plans are available. Yeah, we're that not we're not cutting NASA. kits. Uh, yeah, not not cutting kits for that one anymore. Um, uh, it it uh, eventually fell below, uh, you know, sales wise below viability. So sure. this happens whether you're uh, manufacturer building cars or. And this is a super quick question. This one was just, um, it looks like possibly these dinghies that we're talking about right now have very different construction methods between each other. And I think that possibly the Handy Andy is a little bit closer to Faye in type of construction. Handy Andy and Faye are very similar. But that we're talking about changing the type of construction possibly with, with the materials and making it harder with a fiberglass. Um, exterior and doing strip built rather than Carvel built. I just wanted to, yep. to say that for folks. Yeah. And um, do, 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 do. yeah, pretty much no matter what design of these we pick, we're going to change the construction of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it'll most likely end up being strip built and glassed yep. unless we go with the flat bottom and then. And I'm standing Maybe really we'll close to Steve else. so you can hear me <laughs> <laughs> over his microphone. Uh, and then Steve, Steve says, uh, the practicalities of these small boats is very important, and I'm enjoying hearing John Harris's views on different designs. Nice. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. If you're just joining us, we're talking with John Harris from Chesapeake Lightcraft, and we're going over some of the dinghy designs. If you missed the beginning and you want to watch it later, it'll be um, it'll be available. Yep. And um, and we're just going to do this stream for about another 15 minutes or so, and we're so glad you're joining us. Yeah. Yeah. So this is Faye. So this Faye's is very beautiful. similar yeah. construction to Handy Andy, uh, just a bit bigger. I just have to stop and just once again marvel at William Atkins' sense of proportion and, uh, you know, just how perfect this is. I mean, just the, uh, the it, doesn't, it doesn't have a lot of shear, and one wonders if maybe this was because it was going to be upside down on the boat. Uh, yeah. If you look at, um, in the boat we were looking at a moment ago, it has a lot of shear, and so when it's upside down, um, you've got this big gap, <laughs> you know, yeah. you've got, it's sitting on the stem and the transom. So, uh, I've seen a lot of dinghies that had a, that were even straight shored because when they were upside down, they, they fit the coach roof. That makes which, sense. Yeah. I mean, the, it might not be as pretty to look at. It's not as pretty, but, but it's, it's super very functional. functional. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know, I, I, I've seen, so I remember, um, the very young Ashley Butler, the, the, um, Wunderkind, uh, uh, British boat builder, um, Coming in here, he, he, he came in here in, uh, to Annapolis when he was, oh, I don't know, he, he looked like he was 16, although he was probably 19 or 20, but he had built a dinghy for the, uh, uh, I guess, it was it Ziska, I believe, was his, his first, uh, sure. you know, uh, re restored 100-year-old fishing smack or whatever, and he'd built a dinghy, strip length, um, that had a really unusual shear line. Um, that I kind of looked at like this at first, and I realized uh, when it's turned upside down, it fit almost hermetically around the, you know, the the, the deck or the coach roof. And, uh, yeah. So you know that's a change that people make. But boy, you know, I I just enjoying looking at Faye here and just you know just yeah. What what a pretty boat. And, and one of the know, things that so. I really like about Faye is the way, I and mean, and we could modify the rigs for the other ones, obviously, but all of the spars fit inside sure. the hull. Yeah. Right. Which is really really nice. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's it's also nice to have you know maybe one of the spars is a boat hook too. Oh, that's a nice. You know, yeah. right? There you go. You know, I mean that's <laughs> that's that's the uh, that's the way you do. It. You, you know, uh, I have goosebumps. Yeah, I yeah, love that's that not... type of practicality. Well, I mean, it, when it's you're cruising like on a small boat, everything you eight know, foot four. Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah, I mean, space <laughs> space is you know is uh, everything does have to kind of be be uh, uh, available to do everything and and. Uh, so yeah, I, I've had some boats where um, the whisker pole for the big boat was also the the mast for the uh, for the for That's the, the dinghy, you know. So 
Um, but this one, you know, I think it's an awful lot like Handy Andy, but you know, in terms of practicality, you've got enough length to have the kind of stability you need. Um, I almost think as an eight footer with a, a, a stem uh, as opposed to a bow transom is probably going to be something that wouldn't get used as much because of the capacity and stability issues. So um, I guess that's why most eight foot dinghies have a pram bow. And that's, uh, yeah. uh, but this one would, would have quite a lot of stability. It looks fairly heavy, um, but again, we're already past the you know, picking it up by hand threshold. So, um, yeah. so you're going to be putting, you're, you're going to be craning this in no matter what. Um, likewise, flipping it over on deck, probably not going to happen. You know, maybe, except maybe once, you know, for a long passage or something. Passage. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, but uh, this one looks to me like it was also designed to be canvas covered. Um, I'm not sure it's mentioned. Um, but looking she at the, it, it's, it's, it, this is, you know, what I almost call canoe construction, you know, with all of these um, uh, closely spaced frames and uh, uh, the way he's got it, you know, it's got quite a thin uh, uh, hull shell. So you see here planking uh, three sixteenths inches. Yep, there you go, canvas. Three sixteenths is thin um, for all of you metric people. Um, that's equal to about 11 hectares. Um, so, uh, and it says cover with 10 ounce canvas. So 10 ounce canvas, uh, again, for the metric folks, um, that's, uh, I guess, nine or 10 furlongs, I think. Is that right? So anyway, so this is a wood canvas. It's built like a canoe, uh, like, like, a, like an old fashioned canoe. Again, so that it stays dry. So clearly was intended to be a tender for somebody um, uh, on, uh, on a larger boat, uh, canvas covered, and uh, so if we were to to build Faye, you're saying Handy Andy would probably just need one frame in the middle if strip sure, built and glassed. Sure, yeah. What would you say with Faye? Uh, maybe two frames. <laughs> you know, yeah. right. so, you know, how many is this? Oh, this is this is ten feet, and it's got three. So you know, one in the middle, and then one of these. So, so, so yeah. it may be three frames. You know, um, basically one at each thwart, um, something like that. And one thing that was uh, recommended to me, and I would be interested in your take on it, was they were saying that whatever we do for a tender, they would get rid of the centerboard trunk, and they would put removable lee boards on it mm. so that the whole interior was open and you didn't have the trunk to deal with. And I thought it was an interesting idea, um, yeah. pros and cons both ways. So I was wondering what your thoughts on that were. I, you know, I, I own boats with lee boards. I've designed boats with lee boards. Um, lead boards are really good at one thing, which is opening up the interior of the boat. You know, Performance-wise, I'm less thrilled, and, I, and that may just be me. I came up in racing dinghies, and so I'm always a, a little uh, uh, really tweaky about sailing performance. And having a centerboard or a daggerboard, uh, a non-surface piercing foil, um, I think you'll end up sailing the boat more because it takes a little time to actually mount the lee boards, you know. So if you uh, uh, if you have this built in, uh, I think it's a it's a, a more efficient uh, uh, sailboat. So that's my opinion. I, I, there, and there is a place for lee boards. Don't get me wrong. I, again, I own a couple of boats with lee boards, but um, the thing you got to think about is uh, especially. Um, uh, not flooding the boat while it's under tow through a daggerboard trunk. Uh, oh, yeah. And, and again, I, I have done this a bunch of times. You know, we've, we've gone uh, with these boats um, to uh, a trunk plug um, that, and, and I don't mean maybe, I mean, it, it fills the trunk and it's got a cap, and uh, it really ought to have a turn tab that holds it down. down yeah. Too because uh, they do float up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think experience. I think I was towing this very boat and, and managed to fill it almost to the uh, seats before I realized that I was about to pull the bow off the boat. Oh, no. It's just that, that happens. So I, I don't know. Um, John, one thing about the centerboard trunk I just wanted to say, I think that the reason why I was like, lee boards would be cool because I think I'm one of these people is because I know a couple of dinghies, more than a couple, that have needed uh, centerboard trunk 
maintenance at some mm -hmm. point because yeah, it's yeah. hard to get to with paint and things sure. like that. But it, I don't know. So you're saying it makes that much of a difference in sale performance where if you need to do a centerboard trunk repair at some point, it's worth it. Well, in 2021, I mean, a centerboard trunk <laughs> might be, most likely is going to be epoxy in place. Right. So, uh, you know, when I was coming up, center boards were the number one leaky thing um, because they were they were screwed down maybe in bedding compound and the idea was that every at, at regular intervals you unscrewed it and and caulked it again and screwed it back down whereupon it would begin leaking again almost in, immediately <laughs> um, nowadays we we uh we use epoxy and just you know you can see this boat it's you know it's it's got an epoxy fillet around the bottom of the trunk and uh, uh, it's never going to leak there. Uh, I, I can think of, you know, hundreds of, uh, of epoxied in trunks. I can think of maybe one that rotted. And the reason was that it sat full of rainwater um, for a long, long time. That's even, It'll epoxy, do it. <laughs> yeah, epoxy is not a miracle material. And, it's, and, and water is a wonderful solvent and we'll find a way in eventually. but. Yeah, um, that's. Uh, uh, I, I'm a true believer as, as as regards epoxy, you know, for for just reducing maintenance. And, uh, that's. Uh, so if you had to pick in conclusion one of these three to go on top of your 38 foot cruising boat, mm -hmm. what uh, what do you think your choice would be? Well, I'd have to say bigger. You know, um, as much as I like the little one, that would be a second tender. You know, if you if you were lucky enough to be able to carry two, you know, that would be. Um, so that maybe someone's not stranded if you're ashore in the big in the big tender, or if you just wanted maybe one of them is more focused on sailing, while the other one is just purely a functional pickup truck. So I would I would probably rule out for 38 foot. I'd probably rule out the eight foot dinghy, um, especially a stem dinghy because it's not going to have as much stability as you want um, if you're climbing aboard in a choppy harbor, and or you've had a few painkillers uh, or whatever so uh, the the flat bottom boat uh, it really wins in terms of stability okay um, getting in and out of the mothership again um, you know it's just not always a perfect c conditions are not always perfect for getting in and out of a dinghy um, you've got a big big uh, padded ra rub rail so it's pounding up against the side you know in a rough harbor you can get in the flat bottom boat and you're not gonna continue on into the water yep. and, you know, destroying your cell phone. Um, but, you know, you, you, you're, you're building a beautiful boat, a beautiful Atkin boat. And, and you know, so uh, I think that, that, that Faye has it all around, you know, and uh, the fact that you can strip plank this uh, and glass it inside and out, make it basically, you know, not quite maintenance free, but close to it. Close to it, um, yeah. It, it, it ditch a lot. I mean, if we yeah. uh, if we go down to, to, to two frames and are strip building it and glassing it, we can probably shave a lot of weight out of this. Oh, no? absolutely. I, I think this this ten footer can probably be brought in if you're careful, uh, weighing around 120 pounds. Uh, okay. So that's not nothing. Um, that's like a. You know, I think a laser weighs about 130 pounds. Um, yeah, it's about what I weigh. Right, you know, so, um, you know, you don't want to make it so light that it's flimsy, but um, but, but you could definitely get it a lot lighter. And, uh, you know, uh, the trunk holds up the center seat, so it's kind of out of the way. Um, maybe you move a, so that you can have a passenger either you just extend this forward seat back so you can row from the forward seat while your passenger sits here. If you have a passenger and they're sitting in the stern and you're sitting in the middle, the boat is going to float like that you yeah. know, in the water. I see a lot of that. So, um, you know, the rig is stowed away in its, in its little sunbrella sleeve, you know, wherever you keep it, and you're just rowing. Um, you're sitting in the very eyes of this boat. So, you know, maybe that's the right place for the mass. So you just make that seat broader, you know, so you can sit, you know, 
basically at the one third points, and then 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 you, you you'll look uh, ship shape rowing across the harbor with a, a passenger and back too. But uh, it looks like it's got all the payload you could want to bring stores from shore and uh, uh, all of the caggage, as the the British say, you know. <laughs> All, and then, uh, yeah, all the right. <laughs> as you've been pouring through all your books, are there any Akin tender plans that you think that we should consider that you think would be as good or better than Fe? Um, not right offhand, no. I mean, there, there, there's just there's a wondrous variety in here. Some of them, um, dare I say it, um, are optimized for outboard. Uh, outboard motors. Yep. So a little, they have less rocker in the back, so they've got some flotation to carry an outboard. Um, that's that's one of the problems with the universal impulse to stick an outboard on the back of every boat. Um, if it doesn't have a the buoyancy in the stern, then you, you get this yeah, yeah. insane, you know, bow up. Yeah, because you have the motor in the yeah. back, and then you're sitting in the back. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I I have heard <laughs> from some builders who who did a had the boat do a backflip on them. Oh yeah, wow! It's just like well. Um, yeah, hit a little chop and get some air and yeah, go. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I wish that, that uh, all of these designs were more available. And, you know, it would be great if um, the, the Atkins family maybe could, could compile more of these into a, a new book. Um, you know, you've, you've got um, John Atkin published uh, a, a great design collection. Um, and of there's course, John, there's uh, William. Uh, yeah, his dad, uh, with John, published a couple of, of design collections, um, but it's not all of these. And um, and there's some some of these are misses too, which are almost as instructive as the as the real hits. But um, I uh, the covers are absolutely <laughs> aren't they wonderful? Yeah, I mean the, the books, and if uh, and if folks yeah. are interested in in looking at these plans more or in other Akin plans, a lot of the Akin plans are on their website. So they they've are, got write-ups yeah. uh -huh. for Faye and Handy Andy and Nymph, um, so mm -hmm. you can go read about them. They wrote some uh, some pretty cute things about sure. having a tender and it being cranky, and wherever there's kids, there should be a boat like Faye mm -hmm. or Nymph to go play with. And yeah, so, some of these actually have, you know, where can you buy a book like this now? They've actually got fold-out um, uh, blueprints. Oh. Yeah, skinny yeah. A sailing canoe. All that is old is new. Um, these these are just really fantastic. Um, here's a uh, Charles Mower cat boat here. Um, it's just really neat, and uh, you just don't see books like this anymore. I tell you, um, this is a not an Atkins. They're not they're not all Atkins boats, but um, yeah. Here's a. This is a boat up at your scale, you know. Um, oh, wow. Designed by William Atkin, especially for motorboating. So, yeah. again, name me a motorboating magazine that's going to publish uh, plans for a... Uh, I mean, it uh, still has a, a motor, a, a, right? A, cru a cruising boat, you know. Like this it's an oxidary. Cru cru cruising sailboat, isn't that crazy? So, uh, really, really, really neat. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd love to see these, uh, these published in one volume. I think it would be a... A real, uh, really nice thing. But the uh, the Atkins website is wonderful, and um, uh, what they there are a lot of these boats that are not in their published books um, yep. are on their website um, and available um, as a roll of plans, and uh, uh, and they include for the most part at least the opening paragraphs from the description uh, in in. In uh, motorboating, so uh, so check out the Atkins website. Be a good thing to link uh, there. Um, yeah. All boats that are traditionally built, so dif different different skill set from what we're used to at Chesapeake Land Craft. But, uh, yeah. but really, really neat boats. I'm just looking up and seeing if there's a few questions or anything we can answer before we before we take off. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, everybody. Um, <laughs> Don't take Steve's. Um, thank you very much for joining us today, and, and I appreciate everybody telling us where you're where you're writing in from. I think John said something earlier about um, about flooding, and I'm not sure at what there was a misunderstanding, and you had talked about 
flooding for some reason, and it, I think it was when we were talking about center boards. Right. So, um, so, so you, you, if you're towing a boat with a center board, water can come jetting through the, through the the right. opening. Right, and, and that's and that's actually a negative thing, and I don't water, think yeah. I don't think John yeah. said that that was a negative. It's it, it explicitly, but definitely yeah, sure. you don't want any flooding in the boat for the purposes right. of towing, so, which so is like this is a major understanding. Here, this. Yeah, that's a great you know it's a great point. And, yeah, you know, so we've switched over, and you know, here's another another dinghy. This is a nesting dinghy. Um, again, it's got a it's got a plug. Um, you know that's that's a pretty. So I've yeah. even put a gasket around my. Oh before. sure. Yeah, oh absolutely. Having a gasket, it, it ought to have a gasket around it. Why it doesn't is probably just because so it's just been to lost be, or something. So. Just to be super clear, that doesn't protrude through the bottom of the boat. That's nope. just a plug for just when plug. you're towing it. And it's flush, so you can sit on it um, in comfort. Uh, something also important. You know, this one, uh, it, it should have a little finger pull like this, and. And we did it with a piece of line. So again, you can sit on this um, comfortably. Um, right, so, it has a uh, recess in the fort. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh -huh. And then what's the actual center board for this, just so we can see them in comparison, is that's what's on the stern there? Yeah, it, it stows, um, stows uh, behind the seat here. Oh, that's smart. Yeah, like, like, like <laughs> everything I've ever done, it was stolen from Joel White um, and his uh, nutshell pram and, and shellback dinghy, stowing the um, the blades at the back, but uh, yeah, here's a dagger board that uh, go in here while sailing. I get I get a lot of people who ask about you know how do we come up with the capacity uh, numbers for for boats like this, and um, they're like, geez, I mean, you it seems really low. I mean, so why can't this boat carry more weight? And, and the reason is that the the effective freeboard of this dinghy. Is actually the height of the centerboard trunk. So if you've got the boat uh, okay. loaded to where um, the o the opening uh, of the trunk is level with the water, now you are flooding through the trunk. So uh, that's the um, that's the that's the limiting factor. That's the limiting factor. Yeah. So you know we have some boats that don't have centerboard trunks and they have much higher payloads. So yeah. that's, uh, that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, that's. Uh, Cool. Well, John, thank you so much. Thank you for coming this is, by. This uh, very, yeah, was very, very insightful. I've learned a lot. I can talk about small boats all day. I uh, definitely get that impression. I, in fact, I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, it. that's exactly what I'm going to be doing today is talking about small boats all day. And uh, there are so many great designs out there. Uh, of course, we'd love you to build one of these. But uh, um, I love looking at the uh, collecting and finding these old designs. Uh, if only uh, to, to uh, reassure myself that, you know, it's all been done before. It's and, all been and, done. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, and, and there's nothing new. And, and uh, I, I have to say, I, I have to get in a pitch, a, a pitch in for, for Chesapeake Lightcraft. We, we have a boat now um, that I did not design. Um, it's called the PT-11. It was designed by Russell oh, Brown. Yes. And um, <laughs> let me tell you what. You know, I, I've been designing boats like this for ever, basically. Uh, and, you know, I, I said this to Russell Brown at one point. I said, you know, I, I thought I pretty much knew what you could do with an 11-foot dinghy. Like, the, it, you were, this was the performance threshold that you could reasonably expect until I stepped into the PT-11 nesting dinghy designed um, by, by Russell. Uh, with help from Paul Beaker, and and um, that is just a it was a just a a revelation um, in terms of performance. And then you know I talked about the three things you know the uh, stability, durability, payload, and it, it just that boat manages to win on all of those accounts, but it still sails like a racing dinghy. It'll plane, you know, and um, it's light. It's really light. But it's really durable, and it has a has a lot of payload. And um, uh, they they were out of production for a little while, uh, and now available again as a kit from Chesapeake Lightcraft. Cool. Uh, so, cool. but I think you know, Google PT11 uh, dinghy and, and and check that one out. Check out the videos. And that is a you know, it's just uh, it's something that's completely new, and and I don't I haven't found an analog to that. 
uh, design, which I think just shows um, really how much of a genius Russell Brown is more than anything. <laughs> so that's one to check out. Nice. Well, uh, I'm wrap it up. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us, everybody. And Steve. Yeah, thank you. I uh, hope you enjoyed the little glimpse of the show. We're going to be going live a couple more times throughout the show. Um, so we're going to be doing that at 1 o'clock. Let's see, tomorrow and Sunday, so Saturday and Sunday. Um, so if you haven't clicked that bell for the notifications, you should do that so that you don't miss when we go live. If you do miss it, we will archive it like we always do, so you'll be able to see it later. Uh, and we'll just be kind of wandering around the show and showing you cool things that, that we find. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. We really enjoyed having you here and talking to John about thank the you. boat designs. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. I think I'm just going to walk everybody down to the water, and thanks, boys. Thanks. There we go. Thank you, Steve. If anyone has any last minute questions, I can answer those while I'm walking. I can't answer them on the fly because uh, the, uh, the folk on camera can't see what you're saying, but I can see what you're saying. Figured I'd take a little question and answer session in case anybody had a, uh, had a question or two. I'm Annie B. I'm the Anne behind the curtain. Thank you so much for saying where you're, where you're watching from. It means a great deal to us. Thank you for your support on Patreon. Thank you for your support when you buy t-shirts. We had a really great bonfire campaign. Heyo from Philly, heyo from Georgia. Seen the Netherlands. Some about flags, huh? From the UK, England, Thailand. Minneapolis, St. Louis, hail from Germany. Arkansas, Australia. Thank you so much, friends. Yorkshire. We appreciate all of you. One o'clock tomorrow, one o'clock Sunday. We'll be back here. This will be available to watch um, later on when it uploads. And we hope to see you at both of those times tonight. If you're actually in the area, tonight at 4 o'clock, we'll be meeting at Pusser's for a meet and greet. We're so glad you've joined us. Thanks for your support.